Opponent. If Brahman be not an object of knowledge, it cannot logically be presented by the scriptures as stated in Brahma Sutra 113. Namaste. So the opponent is busy coming up with nonsense arguments as to why the scriptures in general and the Upanishads in particular, cannot give knowledge of Brahman. What is he referring to? Brahma Sutra 113, the previous Adhikarana, begins with the Sutra Shastra Yonitvat, and this Adhikarana, the fourth Adhikarana, begins with the Sutra Tattu Samanvat. Vyasadeva is saying, the scriptures are the source of knowledge of Brahman. And not only just the scriptures, but specifically the Upanishads. What makes the Upanishads so special? Because they deal with the root ontology, the very fundamental essence of being and consciousness. So this is expressed in the Vedic saying, Tattvamasi, thou art that. This is known as the Mahavakya, because it is the great saying that reveals Brahman. So let's listen to what Shankaracharya has to say in response to this objection by the opponent. Not so. For the scriptures aim at the removal of the differences fancied through ignorance. Not that the scriptures seek to establish Brahman as an entity referable objectively by the word this. What do they do then? By presenting Brahman as not an object on account of its being the inmost self of the knower, they remove the differences of the known the knower, and the knowledge that are fancied through ignorance. So this triplicity, or triple, as it's called technically, is the root ontology that determines what we call duality. I see the cat. Huh? I is the subject. C is the action or the verb, and cat is the object. So we divide everything in reality into the subject, the action, and the object. However, in non-duality, there is no difference. And by contemplating the Vedic Mahavakya, that thou art, well, you are Brahman. So if we look at it from our point of view and say, I am Brahman, contemplating on this saying alone destroys the duality, or actually the triplicity, at the core of maya, which is the manifestation, which is the world, which is illusion, ignorance, and so on, leading to suffering. So how does it do that, and, and how does it work exactly, is described in this wonderful footnote, which I'm going to read next. The idea is expressed thus in the Brihararanyaka Commentary for 420. The scriptures, too, describe the self merely by the negation of the activities of the subject, the evidences of knowledge, and so on and not by resorting to the usual function of a sentence in which something is described by means of names. Therefore, even in scriptures, the self is not presented like heaven or Mount Meru, for instance, 
The knowledge of Brahman, too, means only the cessation of the identification with extraneous things, such as the body. Thus, since Brahman is not presentable positively by saying, this is so, it cannot be the object of scriptural knowledge in this sense, but it can be presented negatively as not this, not this, neti neti. And thus it can be known from the scriptures, which are a valid means of knowledge. This is technically explained thus. Brahman is comprehended in the unanalyzable mentation, vritti, of the form, I am Brahman, that arises from hearing the great Upanishadic saying, that thou art. And yet, Brahman is said to be inexpressible by words, because it is not comprehended by the resulting consciousness or apprehending consciousness, pala, which is defined as the mentation with the reflection of consciousness on it. In common experience, the mentation of the form of a pot with the reflection of consciousness on it goes out of a person to envelop the pot. Then that mentation destroys the ignorance about the pot. Still, the witnessing consciousness is needed to reveal the pot through a manifestation of the identity of the consciousness underlying the pot and the apprehending consciousness. The mentation about Brahman destroys the ignorance about and the ignorance subsisting on it. But the apprehending consciousness cannot reveal Brahman, the phala meditation being included in ignorance itself as the latter's product, so that it gets destroyed along with that ignorance and can have no further action. So, for those of you who have been wondering why we and the scriptures also insist that Brahman can never be an object of any process of knowledge, including consciousness, meditation, etc., etc. This is exactly why and how. Because Brahman is everything. Brahman is everywhere. So Brahman is equally in myself and in the object perceived such as a pot. So when I perceive the pot, I imagine that there is a difference between the consciousness in me and the consciousness in the pot. However, this is illusion. This is ignorance. This is untrue. The actual reality is that there is no difference. But because of sense perception and the persistence of maya in the creation and so forth, we are able to imagine that there is a difference. And that leads to knowledge, the knower, and the object as the triple distinction underlying all manifestation. However, in the case of Tatvamasi, if I start to think, oh, I am Brahman, then I understand that Brahman is everything. Brahman is everywhere. And there is no longer any foundation to making a distinction between this consciousness and that consciousness between the consciousness in myself and the consciousness in perceived objects, such as the pot, etc. Because of this, then it becomes impossible to perceive anything except Brahman. However, because of the lack of duality, there is no sensation of consciousness as is stated in that wonderful quote from Brihadaranyakopanishad, when to the knower of Brahman, everything has become the self, then what is there to see and through what? What is there to know and through what? Through what, O oh Maitreyi, can one know 
that by which everything is known. So Brahman is pure consciousness. Ultimately, it is conscious only of itself, or actually I should say it is aware only of itself. This is Turiya. Turiya means awareness of awareness. I am aware of the fact that I am aware. And what am I aware of? Myself. <laughs> My awareness. Are you aware that you are aware that you are aware? You see how this goes? It's a repeating circular mentation called a vritti. Vritti means a mental modification. And in this case, this particular mental modification leads to the end of mental modifications. It leads to the end of the duality or the triplicity underlying ordinary perception and consciousness. And it leads to the collapse of the distinction, the imaginary distinction, I should point out, between the knower, the known, and the knowledge. So this is the actual function of this Upanishadic knowledge, tattvamasi. When one meditates and contemplates on the observation that I am the self, I am Brahman. I could not be anything else but Brahman because Brahman is all there is. Therefore, there is no distinction between the knower and the known. There is no distinction between the self and not self. There is no individual because the individual would have to be separate from Brahman. And that is simply ontologically impossible. So here we have the mechanism underlying enlightenment. And another point is that this vritti of I am Brahman is unanalyzable. In other words, it cannot be broken down. It is not composed of parts like any ordinary thought having a subject, an object, and an action. Therefore, non-duality is the default state of the being, the self, Brahman. Brahman is all there is and all that can be. Yet, due to the imaginary difference between the self and the non-self, the perceiver and the perceived, the drik and the drishya, the seer and the seen, we imagine an entire creation, a world based on differences and duality. It's amazing, isn't it, how this works? But the single thought, I am Brahman, dissolves all of this. And by means of that thought, we come to embody the essence which is nothing but non-differentiated Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.